really getting up against time here, so the, uh, the next speaker has uh, been allocated uh, uh, 90 reps per minute rather than 75, uh, and you'll just have to take notes a little bit faster, so Michael Potter. Thank you. Yes, uh, first of all, before I um, say and make my points, I'd just like to uh, point out the views that I'm presenting in this uh, presentation of mine alone. Um, for, uh, as my uh, co-presenters have focused on poverty and redistribution, I'm going to focus more upon the rich per se. Um, and I'm specifically looking at whether the wealth accumulation of the rich harms the poor. So, does it? And the answer is, in some cases, yes. In some circumstances, yes, the wealth accumulation of the rich does harm the poor. Now, I've got two basic categories which I put that into. First of all, in my first category, I look at a grouping um, which I call corruption, theft, government preferment, and rent seeking. That's my first categorisation. The second grouping, I look at, I say, negative externalities. So, in both cases, if you've got corruption, theft, government preferment, rent seeking, or negative externalities, wealth accumulation does harm others, including the poor. So an increase in wealth and inequality for these reasons is bad. But wealth and inequality are not the underlying problems. The underlying problems are those two points that I made there. So for point number one, corruption, theft, government for rent seeking, there is a common factor. What we're seeing is a transfer of wealth, a transfer of wealth from one part of the society to another. It is zero sum or even negative sum. I'm going to focus on government preferment and rent seeking and I will briefly look at negative externalities later. So government preferment, what does it entail? It entails two things. First of all, it entails a wealth transfer. As I said, a transfer from the many to the few, to the, to the people who are getting the government preferment. It takes the money off most for the benefit of the few. The second thing it entails is inefficiency, which is taking money off everybody in society. No one benefits from this. Some benefit from the wealth transfer, nobody benefits from the inefficiencies. And there are quite a few examples which I've got up here. Uh, taxi regulation, uh, pharmacy location and ownership regulations, occupational licensing, uh, particularly medical specialists, copyright and patents, and land planning. And I will come back to land planning, which has already been mentioned. Some of these regulations uh, create wealth. You'll be aware of some people and some of the who make benefit uh, and get a lot of money from these regulations, particularly land planning. But all of these regulations create inefficiencies. And a couple of examples of inefficiencies are that these regulations mean the price ends up being above cost and that they, innovate, and they inhibit innovation. So, what should we do about government preferment? Well, it's actually not too difficult. Let's reduce it by broadening the free market. So, just some examples are we can abolish taxi licences and the pharmacy ownership and, and location regulations. The free market reduces government preferment. And, guess what? This will help the poor. Um, it may also reduce the inequality and some wealth, but very importantly, this is not the aim of doing it. You don't do these things because they help the poor or reduce inequality or limit excessive wealth. Now I might just quickly talk about the impact of government preferment on overall wealth. And another surprising result is it could be large. It may be large. I just might mention firstly that there's an article in the most recent edition of the Australian Economic Review by Fritz Foster arguing that almost all of the top 200 richest people in Australia got their three government preferment. Now, uh, this uh, argument is actually quite debatable because they actually say a large uh, number of those people uh, work in the finance industry. And they say the finance industry is there for government preferment. That's debatable. Um, you could take different positions on that. Much better data is uh, from an American economist, Matt Rogelney, is that large parts of wealth accumulation over recent decades in developed countries, such as Australia, is from housing. And guess what? Housing price increases have come from land planning rules, which is government preferment. So uh, there is a good argument that a large part of wealth 
uh, growth in wealth in recent decades has come from government preferment. And I've uh, got a, an article in the recent edition of the CIS's policy magazine which goes through this in some more detail. Next I might talk about executive salaries. It is sometimes argued by quite a few on the left, particularly Thomas Piketty, that executive salaries are a for what I might call a private form of rent seeking. Executives conspire with boards of directors and others to garner for themselves large and unwarranted salaries unrelated to profit. There are billions of problems with this argument, and I'll go through some of them. First of all, and probably the most important argument, is that every dollar that goes to a CEO comes from a shareholder. Shareholders are making mistakes in handing over too much money to executives. It sounds a bit weird, particularly when you think that shareholders are are generally reasonably sophisticated. And notice that if the shareholders are doing this, hundreds of thousands of shareholders are making the same mistake at thousands of companies. It doesn't make sense. And another point is that um, the problem, if this argument were true, the problem would be smaller than private companies because it's harder to conspire against private companies. Private companies have got fewer shareholders, they'll each own more. It's harder to conspire against them. But what does the data say? The data shows the exact opposite. The increase in salaries is greater at private companies, not smaller. Next, I'll um, point out um, the increase in salaries of non-executives, so like media, arts, entertainment, sports, and the top professions. They are growing at the same rate. So it can't be poor corporate governance which is causing this problem. And related, Point, um, corporate governance at companies has actually improved over the recent decades. This is where we've seen the big salary increases. So the corporate governance was, wasn't as good you know, a century ago, and executive salaries were smaller. So that again doesn't fit with the argument. Instead, what, what are the better arguments? I won't go through these in detail, but they basically group them into technology and globalisation. Now more broadly, market transactions are these a problem? And the answer is, in general, no. Are they, sorry, to be clear, are they a problem for poverty? Generally, no. The only real exception is when a market transaction creates externalities, when a transaction between two people causes impact on a third. And I need to make it precise, and I'm talking about non-pecuniary externalities. Now, if there are externalities, then the best way to deal with them is deal with them directly. Address the property rights, fix the property rights so that you are dealing with that problem of the externalities. So let's assume that, that is fixed. Then, what is the problem? Many people complain about so called unfairness of transactions. You've probably heard the uh, arguments that Walmart pays its uh, uh, staff too little, or that international trade helps um, harm poor nations. Now, this doesn't actually make sense. And the reason is because it's a voluntary transaction. If it is a voluntary transaction, then both parties benefit. If they didn't, then they wouldn't enter into the transaction. It seems pretty obvious to me. And I might just quickly mention that correcting balance and imbalance in transactions can create problems, uh, like the minimum wage can create uh, unemployment effects, as been previously mentioned, and they can create rents. Uh, there's a reasonable argument that the current collective bargaining rules transfer large amounts of money from unions, and you could argue that that is rents. There are a whole heap of other problems. I just might mention a couple. One uh, argument uh, against the accumulation of wealth by the rich is that it creates envy. And it is argued that this is a big problem, the government should do something about it. But we as a society, why should we pander to envy? Um, we rightly say that society should not pander to fear or hate, so the uh, obvious question is, well, why should we therefore pan for envy? And the uh, last point I'll make on this is that um, it's often argued that wealth accumulation by the rich is bad because the rich can sway politics. The obvious response to that is, well, reduce the scope of government. If you reduce the scope of government, it's harder for people to sway. Again, it seems fairly obvious to me. I hope that I've um, presented a good taste of the concerns that exist about the accumulation of wealth by the rich. I've basically said that there are two types of accumulation which are problematic. First one is government preferment, or corruption, or theft, so you might first grouping. 
And the second grouping was uh, negative externalities. If these are problems, then you should address them directly. You should address the underlying cause of these concerns. The, if you address these concerns, they probably well help poverty. They may reduce inequality and they may reduce some wealth, but this shouldn't be the target for your policy. The target for your policy should be the underlying problem. And lastly, I might say that the other reasons which I've briefly looked at, the other alleged problems don't stand up to scrutiny. Thank you.